you talk about lung cancer uh, staging, there are two types of staging. One is the clinical staging, which I'm talking about, and there is pathological staging. In pathological staging, you have microscopic control of tumor in all the tissues that are resected. This is a gold standard, but as you know, it is not possible to dissect all the sites of tumor. So in most cases, it is on clinical staging. The clinical staging comprises of a good clinical examination, good imaging studies, and some cases proper. So this is the most common staging we do for lung cancer. So why should we care about staging? Because the treatment of lung cancer is dependent on the stage of the disease. Two, by knowing the stage of the cancer, we can predict the prognosis, which patient is going to survive for how long. Then, to do any research or clinical trials, it's very important to address the stage of the cancer. And more importantly, when you are communicating with different teams, say across the, uh, your own hospital or different teams across the world, you have to have a, a consistent way to communicate and clinical staging is the most appropriate way to communicate. So there are a number of changes that are made in the latest edition of TNM staging, that is the eighth edition. So uh, this, for the eighth edition, uh, it was, uh, the data was collected from over 77,000 patients, and these patients were followed for almost 11 years. The TNM staging of the lung cancer is proposed by the uh, International Association for Study of Lung Cancer. So this is a group uh, which focuses on lung cancer. It comprises of uh, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, thoracic surgeons, uh, thoracic radiologists, pathologists. So this is a huge uh, organization. So uh, this eight edition was implemented in the year 2017. This uh, TMM is the same for both small cell and non-small cell lung cancer. And uh, there are uh, changes that were proposed for the T stage and for M stage. There were no changes uh, in the N uh, stage. So in the TNF staging, let us first talk with the uh, T. T stands for the tumor. When you talk about the T of the lung cancer, we are talking about the size of the tumor, the proximity of the tumor from carina, the effect of uh, lung cancer in, on the distal lung parenchyma in the form of atelectasis or pneumonia, Invasion to adjacent structures, such as for mediastinum or among others. Then the presence of other satellite nodules uh, in the lung itself. So this is the uh, a busy uh, table of uh, different types of T stages. Uh, but it is important to know that the size of the cancer is very important. For every increase of the tumor by a centimeter, there is a change in the prognosis. If the tumor goes from one centimeter to two centimeters, it uh, carries with it a different uh, T designation and it also alters the prognosis of this patient. The other important thing to remember is it is not that important to know if the distal atelectasis is involved in the entire uh, lobe or part of the lobe. Or there is uh, post obstructive pneumonia which is affecting the entirety of the lobe or only a part of the lobe. So it's just important to know if there is distal atelectasis or pneumonia. It is not important anymore to know if it is involved in the entire lobe or not. Then we also know that this is a new thing in this uh, current uh, staging system. Invasion of the diaphragm is very important. If the tumor invades the diaphragm, it has much worse prognosis. And one thing which is not thought to be important is involvement of the media to do that, that is removed from this staging. So as you see here, these, in the TMM stage uh, current 8th edition, we go from tumor less than 1 to tumor more than 7. So in all, there are total of uh, seven different uh, T stages which are possible. So T1 is divided into three, A, B, and C. Two is divided into two, A, and B. Three has only one, four has only one. So because the tumor size is so important, we should know how to measure the tumor. The tumor measurement is the longest axis diameter. This longest axis can be any plane. It can be the axial plane, coronal plane, or sagittal plane. So this is important. And you are measuring the tumor, you are measuring only the tumor, you are not measuring the distal process such as post-substructive atelectasis or post-substructive pneumonia. Then, just like we talked about in lung cancer screening, the T designations are different from solid nodules and they are different to the uh, subsolid nodules. So the, the increase in the size from one to seven, these uh, 
and numbers applied to the solid nodules. So here, for example, a uh, tumor which is less than one centimeter is T1A, a tumor is over one centimeter is uh, T1B, and tumor which is over two centimeters but less than three is a T1C. So this size applies for solid nodules. Then what about the subsolid nodules? In the subsolid nodules, up to the size of three centimeters, there is only one that is called T1. In a secure ground glass, which is called as in situ. If the subsolid module also has some solid components, then it is called minimally invasive, stands for MI. Okay. A T2 lesion is uh, anything which is over 3 centimeters, but less than 5 centimeters. Again, it is divided into two categories T2A and T2B. Uh, and there are other features which also confer a T2 status to a lung cancer. If the tumor invades the visceral pleura, it is called a T2 tumor. If the tumor is causing either atelectasis or pneumonia in the distal lung parenchyma, that is also called as a T2 tumor, irrespective of the size of the tumor. Say the tumor is only like say 5 millimeters, but if that is causing distal lactasis or a distal pneumonia, that becomes a T2 tumor. A, a T2 tumor can involve the main bronchus, but it should not involve the carina. This is very important. Before in the past, there's a lot of emphasis was made on involvement of the lobar bronchus or not, but in the current system, only thing you have to think about is, is it uh, away from the carina or not? So the amount of distal collapse or atelectasis or uh, pneumonia is not important. Any amount of atelectasis or pneumonia distal to the tumor will convert to a T2 diagnosis. Then uh, he said endobronchial lesion, the location is not important. As long as it is spreading the carina, it is still a T2 tumor. The visible pleural incursion is uh, not so easy to uh, diagnose on imaging. Uh, we are not very accurate as imaging specialists. The best way to diagnose visceral pleural involvement is to do uh, elastin staining of the pathology, which is a gold standard. But there are some clues which will uh, suggest that there could be visceral pleural involvement. So some of the clues are if the nodule is causing thickening and retraction of the pleura. So this is a uh, good uh, indicator that there is a possible involvement of the visceral pleura. And you remember the, uh, the layers of the fissures they comprise of two layers of visceral pleura. So the fissure is thickened or involved. It is highly likely that the visceral pleura is also involved. Uh, just because the tumor is reaching up to the pleural surface does not mean that it's a visceral pleural involvement. So in this case, there was no visceral pleural involvement. So the presence of pleural tags by itself does not make it a T2 tumor uh, in, by taking into consideration the possibility of visceral pleural involvement. If the tumor is crossing the fissure, suppose say here, the tumor is involving the left lower lobe and it is also involving the adjacent lingula, we know that it's crossed the fissure, therefore it is definitely a T2 tumor. A T2 tumor uh, is a tumor that involves a chest wall, but uh, it is also a tumor which has got an adjacent nodule in the lung parenchyma within the same lobe. Uh, it can also be because of involvement of a nerve which causes diaphragm paralysis or it is involving the parietal pericardium. So, chest wall invasion is an important thing to figure out because almost all the pancreas tumors we know are PT tumors because they involve the chest wall. So, but the diagnosis of chest wall is not that easy. We are very good at uh, diagnosing definite involvement of the chest wall. The two definitive signs are chest wall mass, that is a mass which is present in the chest wall musculature, or this destruction or bone destruction such as vertebral body destruction. Short of that, it is not easy to say or predict the chest wall invasion. There are a number of other uh, soft signs which suggest chest wall invasion, but they are not very confident in those situations. So here, the two definitive signs are, there is a clear rib destruction here. So this is the chest wall involvement. You are clearly seeing a mass which is going into the pectoral muscles here. So this is a chest wall invasion. So this is definitely a definitely a P3 tumor. So this is the same thing on the uh, uh, cross-sectional imaging here. So there's a rib destruction, and on the soft tissue because you're also seeing the mass which is extending into the posterior chest wall. So this is definitely a, uh, a T3 tumor. So on the other hand, if you have a mass which is broad based towards the pleura, 
there's a large area of contact of more than 3 centimeters, or if the uh, ratio of the contact to the surface and the diameter of the tumor is more than 0.5, or if there's augmentation of extracurricular fat, these are all some of the soft signs of the chest wall invasion, but uh, you may be surprised that at uh, surgery, they may not need chest wall invasion. So this is something to think about. Uh, they, there is involvement of the vertebra, uh, and there is involvement of the neural foramina. It is very important to see what is the distance of the tumor from the adjacent uh, spinal cord because it has a lot of bearing on the treatment options. So here, for example, this mass, which is going into the uh, skeleton along the vertebra here, has got some neural foramen extension. In this situation, we have to measure the distance from the so-called tumor here and the spinal cord. The distance should be at least one centimeter for this patient to receive adequate uh, dose of radiation. If the distance is less than one, especially if it is less than uh, 0.5 centimeters, uh, there is a risk of causing uh, or injury with radiation. A T4 lesion is the lesion which either denotes the serena or involves the diaphragm, it becomes a T4 tumor. These tumors tend to carry uh, worse proteases. A tumor which uh, involves the uh, media spinal is a T4 tumor, and a tumor which causes local cord paralysis is also a T4 tumor. So, what are the signs, other signs of T4 tumor? So, before we said that the patient has got a cancer in the lobe, and also a satellite not with the same low, it is a, a T3 tumor. For a T4 tumor, you can have a nodule in a different low, but in the same line. Say for example, if this patient has a tumor in the right lower low, and there's a satellite nodule or another discrete nodule in the uh, middle low or upper low, it becomes a T4 tumor. But important thing to remember is, the nodule is still in the same line. That is the right one in this case. Just like we have features for chest wall invasion, there are also definitive features and uh, possible features of or signs of invasion for media sun involvement. But for media sun involvement, we have 100% sure of possible tumor invasion if there is extensive replacement of the media sun or fat with the tumor, or if the known media sun or structures such as SVC, esophagus, or one of the bronchus, main bronchus is completely encircled by the tumor. Say for example here, most of the media spinal fat is replaced by the tumor. The tumor is going in front of the tumor. So this is gross media spinal invasion. This is definitely unequivocal T4, no doubt. Similarly here, this tumor is invading the or encircling the esophagus. Therefore, it is a gross media spinal invasion, no doubt. Another gross example of uh, media spinal invasion is if the tumor is going into the cardiac chambers or tumor is causing a CC syndrome, then it is a growth invasion, no doubt. But the problem arises when the tumor is along the mediastinal surface, but it is not completely replacing the most of the mediastinal fat, or if it is not encircling the major structures of the mediastinal, such as SVC, esophagus, or other arteries, then you do not know. So, it's a very high sensitive sign for media sterilization, but the specificity in other kind is very low. So just because the tumor is reaching up to the media sinus does not make it media sterilization. So if this patient does not have any other uh, distant metastasis or nodal disease, most surgeons would like to explore this patient and see if they can suck out the tumor. And many of these tumors do not have any media sterilization uh, at the time of surgery. A superior surface tumor because it's in all such a small the PT tumor. But a superior surface tumor, if it is in great capillary plexus, it becomes a T4 tumor. So what is the role of PET CT? I know there's a talk which is coming up, but this one's are not uh, spent too much time. But it, it improves your accuracy of uh, T staging. So for example, a patient like this who has got a central tumor, uh, which is also causing lobar attractiveness of the left lower lobe, by doing the uh, combined uh, PET with CT, you can accurately measure the tumor. So this gives you the correct uh, assessment of the T stage. Because here there's a lobar reflectors, as you know, at the minimum this is a T2 tumor, but to know if it is T3 or T4, we need to measure the tumor size. Because the tumor is 6.7, you know it is at least a T3 uh, tumor. Similarly, subtle invasion in the pareto pleura 
or involvement of extracellular fat can also be better assessed by doing uh, combining CT with the fat. Here, you reach a PG of taking the extracellular fat, definitely there is a possibility that there is involvement of extracellular fat and fat. So overall, FEXT is the best way to diagnose, uh, make assessment of these stage. We'll go on to the end. N is the trickiest uh, one of all the staging systems. Uh, when you talk about the end stage, we talk about the location of the lymph nodes, how to measure the lymph nodes. We measure lymph nodes in the short axis. We have to take into account the DG update. And finally, almost all of the DG biopsy confirmation. So this is the staging system for uh, lymph nodes. The numbers go from 1 to 14. The numbers in two digits, that is 10 and beyond, are N1 lymph nodes. They are in the hilum or more distal to the hilum. Whereas numbers from 2 to 9 are in the mediastinum, and number 1 is the supraclavicular lymph nodes. There is some confusion about what, what is a supraclavicular lymph node. A lymph node which is located within the tricord cartilage and thoracic inlet is a supraclavicular lymph node. So technically it involves all the superior supraclavicular lymph nodes. Scaling lymph nodes, and posterior cervical lymph nodes, all these lymph nodes which are located between the tricord cartilage and thoracic inlet are in one lymph nodes. So these are all different examples for the N1 uh, lymph nodes, the arrows are pointing out. The intracarticular lymph nodes can also become supracarticular lymph nodes in this instance. So when you measure the lymph nodes, you're always measuring the short axis. You measure the widest short axis of the lymph node. That is the size of <coughs> any uh, thing over one centimeter is considered a pathological uh, lymph node uh, in uh, radiology terms. So uh, it is also important to understand what is an N1 lymph node. N1 lymph node is not just bilateral lymph node. Any lymph node is filled to it. So a lymph node which is along the uh, subsegmental bronchi, a lymph node along the segmental bronchi, lobar bronchi, all the way to the hilum, all these lymph nodes are called N1 lymph nodes. Because they are stable lymph nodes, when the surgeon does a lobectomy, they take out all these lymph nodes together with the tumor, therefore these are all N1 lymph nodes. Media standard lymph node is a lymph node. Here I want to mention one nodal group in particular, the subcranial lymph nodes. The subcranial lymph nodes are always considered zipsilateral uh, media standard lymph nodes. Say for example, this patient has got a subcranial lymph node here, even if this patient has to have a tumor in the left row, even though uh, the tumor is slightly on the uh, node is slightly on the right side, it is still considered a intralateral lymph node. A entry lymph node is anything which is on the contralateral side of the hilum and the mediastinum, and any supraclavicular lymph node, that is any N1 lymph node, is considered a entry lymph node. Most of the patients with the N2 and the N3 lymph nodes are not considered to be a surgical candidate. So there are a number of challenges by the size criteria. We know that uh, more than 40% uh, of the lymph nodes, which are, metas uh, which are metastatic lymph nodes, measure less than one centimeter. So size is not very accurate. Then uh, we also know that uh, a good number of lymph nodes which measure more than a centimeter in short axis do not have metastasis on uh, pathology. So we are not very good. So PET CT is also not very good. The accuracy is around 78%. Therefore, in most situations, we need to do a biopsy confirmation of the lymph nodes to determine their true and status. There are a number of ways, these are different techniques we use, but I want you to focus on the, the middle and the last one, the bronchographic and endoscopic techniques and the surgical techniques. So there are a number of ways we can transfer the lymph nodes. So by using a combination of these techniques, almost all these uh, lymph nodal groups can be sampled uh, by surgical techniques. So this is used to be the common gold standard media sonoscopy where they would pass a media sonoscope uh, in the pre-critical space to a incision in the uh, thoracic inlet above the sternum. But this is now mostly replaced by uh, endoscopic uh, uh, ultrasound. So we can do uh, bronchoscopy at the rigid or flexible. For rigid, the bronchoscopy can only go to the main bronchi, very difficult to go beyond that. The flexible, uh, flexible bronchoscopy, you can go up to the uh, lobar bronchi, you can park there, and you can pass guide wires and biopsy posters to sample the distal lymph nodes. You can also use electromagnetic navigational bronchoscopy. This allows you to uh, sample even distal lesions, but this requires a uh, special type of table. 
uh, electromagnetic uh, cable and also it requires uh, poor administration of the uh, CT images with the bronchoscopic landmarks such as Carina. And by doing so, you can track uh, this uh, perhaps it is uh, multiple lymph nodes or long duration. But more importantly, now everybody is doing the uh, endocrine ultrasound fevers, and by doing so, you can visualize the lymph nodes and you can also get the samples for uh, accurate staging. So, this is an example of uh, a needle within the lymph node, and they can sample this uh, highlight uh, lymph node landscape. So by doing all this type of different techniques of bronchoscopy, media stenoscopy, you can sample almost all the lymph nodes. And most of the patients who are undergoing curative surgery for uh, lung cancer would have these procedures done to get an accurate handle on the end state. Because size itself is not a good criteria to treat the metastasis, so it's important to sample the lymph nodes. Then we move on to the end state. In the current system, the age stage, a good number of changes were made in the end stage. Now the end stage is M1A, and you have got uh, for intrathoracic metastasis, then you have extrathoracic metastasis, which is again divided into M1B and M1C. So the reason is, if your metastasis confined only to the thorax, your prognosis is better. Even if the metastasis is outside the thorax, it is important to know the number of metastasis. If the metastasis is one or few, what is considered as oligo metastatic disease, the prognosis is great. Or not very good, better than having more number of metastases. So here a patient with got uh, management to diffusion, uh, but the disease is confined to the thorax. Patient has got a contralateral uh, nodule in the lung. Uh, this is a metastatic disease to the thorax. All this fall under what is called as a MRI. So this is metastasis confined to thorax. If the metastasis is outside the thorax, it is important to count the number of metastases. So this patient has got a mass in the right row of mediastinal lymph nodes, also has got a solitary metastasis in the right retina. So this single metastatic disease outside the thorax makes it m one So m one actually has better prognosis than patients having multiple metastasis outside the thorax. So here this patient has got multiple brain mets, also has got multiple uh, liver mets. So this patient has got and one see these patients tend to have the worst prognosis of all the metastatic groups. So I want to touch, uh, uh, emphasize one more time on the lung nodules. Nodule within the same lobe is T3. Nodule within a different lobe on the same lung is T4. A nodule in the contralateral lung becomes a M1A nodule. So PET imaging is very good. I'm sure there's a talk coming after this one, which picks up more upper metastasis. Uh, when you have two different primaries, suppose say this patient has got a tumor in the right upper lobe and a tumor in the right upper lobe, and if they have different histologies, each gets its own uh, T staging. So it gives T staging for this nodule, a different T staging for this nodule. So two different cancers, two separate uh, T stages. The second group, somebody has got multifocal adenocarcinoma of the lung, multiple brown glass nodules, same histology. You ignore all the smaller nodules, focus on the largest nodule, you give the KNM switching for that nodule alone. So this is for multifocal lung cancer. So once you have all these T stages figured out, T, N and M, you have different stages. You can have so many stages here from stage 1A to all the way to stage 4B. And the importance is, as the stage increases, the final age survival drops. For the stage 1A, the survival, final survival is 92%. When you go to 4G, the survival is zero. So this is important of TNM stage. You get TNM, then you derive the clinical uh, stage, then you finish the prognosis, then you also choose the treatment options. Thank you. So uh, now we will uh, we will open the discussion for the for the four uh, for the three the three uh, presentations. So uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Digomarti. And uh, if anyone uh, has uh, questions about the three presentations, any questions? <laughs>